All right, well, in this video, I'll be talking about the results we've seen so far from January through July in 2020. I'll be looking at the, the performance based on a nominal one unit. Then we'll be looking at the performance uh, during the most intense part of the sell-off, which was in February and March of this year. And finally, we'll be looking at the key events that went on, uh, kind of how we adjusted to the increase in volatility utilizing the bull put spreads. I'll go over the advantages of the bull put spreads and then discuss where we go from here. Okay, before we get started looking at the results, I do wanna show the risk disclaimer. Uh, you can go ahead and pause the screen if you want to read it completely, but in essence, what we're stating here is that past performance is not indicative of future performance. I'm also mentioning that I'm not a commodity trading advisor. We do not give personal advice. I do not directly control client under accounts. We use what's called the letter of direction. Also, just remember that uh, even though results have been pretty incredible, the past performance is not indicative of future and that trading futures is definitely not for everyone. So go ahead and pause this if you want to read more um, or look at our website. But with that, I'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so first I wanted to just quickly show the bottom line results of what we've done in 2020 so far. As you're probably aware, we trade four systems. We trade the Wave, Swing, Crusher, and Pro. And what this chart shows is how each algorithm did based on the month for 2020 so far. And then right here, this blue, uh, kind of highlighted area just shows the raw performance total year to date. So what this shows you is that the wave trader has done the best, it's up 54%. The swing trader is in second place with 32%. And those are based off of 20K unit sizes. And then the crusher and the pro trader are up basically about 2% and 6% respectively. And that's based on a 30K account size for those two. So that's really kind of where we're at for the year, but what, what this chart shows is how we did on each month. So what I wanna do is quickly show you um, some of the highlights. Notice how first off in January was pretty good for all four algorithms, they were all up. But notice in February where three of the algorithms were down and only one was up. The one that was up is called the Wave Trader, the other three were down and I'll get into why that was. But it, it has to do with the big drop that we saw in the market uh, towards the end of February. Notice here though, in March, the algorithms actually rebounded a bit, primarily due to the 10 year note. And then we had uh, uh, slight losses in April, slight gains in May, slight losses in June. So we kind of went back and forth. And then in July, uh, the month that we just finished, we had a really good performance. So if you want to look at this closer, feel free to again to pause the screen. But again, um, the, the disclaimers on the bottom apply. Um, so keep in mind, past, past performance is not indicative of future performance. But with that, let's kind of look at the um, at how the Momentum ES and the Momentum TY did in particular. All right, so what I wanted to do is first highlight how we did in uh, January, February, and March on the Momentum ES algorithm. Now, if you've been following along or if you're a customer, you, you know that the Momentum ES is one of the primary algorithms that we trade. It's traded in the, um, the Swing Trader, the Pro Trader, and the S&P Crusher. Uh, we used to call it the Bullfire, so you might hear it uh, called the Bullfire in some of the older videos. But this, in essence, is the main overnight algorithm that we trade the S&P on. And so I wanted to show you the results that it did and kind of what, what all went on as the market was uh, tanking towards the end of February. Because if you remember on this slide, um, the majority of the losses that we saw were in February. On, and that's, be, that's really because of this algorithm. And so I wanted to highlight the, uh, the negative before we go into the positive. So notice first that in January, you can kind of see hopefully how as the market was sort of trading higher, kind of drifting higher, we actually had a lot of winning trades. We were, we, you can't really see it. My intention is not really to show you the details of those, more to give you an idea that we were trading all throughout January but what, and through February as well. But what happened is as the markets rolled over towards the, the last week or two in February, we did get caught in a few losing trades. In fact, we had, I believe, five in a row, but the biggest one, and you can maybe barely see it on the video, is this one I'm trying to kind of highlight here, which occurred on the, um, I believe it was the 25th of February, where we were long, and we had a big gap down against us. And you can kind of see that gap right here. That was the loss that we took that represented the majority of the losses that we saw in February. 
it was a pretty big hit. And I'm going to talk about why that's important later when we talk about the bull put spreads. But really what happened is, is the market started rolling over and, and the U.S. equity market started pricing in the pandemic in essence. We saw massive drops in the S&P and you can see that the S&P went lower in February and then in March as well. Now notice in March, we really didn't have any trades on the S&P. So that's a good thing. So we weren't buying this as it was rolling over. In fact, the last trade we had was towards the end of February. So our, we actually did really well on a relative basis in March. But for sure, February was tough. Um, but if you notice back here, the wave trader actually was profitable in February. Well, the reason why is because the wave trader didn't take that trade. In essence, the wave trader trades a similar algorithm that we call the Geronimo. And it'll take a lot of these same trades, but it tends to not be quite as aggressive. And so that actually worked out for in our favor. So those of you that were on the wave trader actually did really well in February because you didn't have all these losses that I'm highlighting here. You only had the gains that we saw in the 10 year that we'll look at in the next slide. So bottom line, I mean, this is why February was pretty rough for us was because of this initial drop. And if you look at the initial drop, it was really one trade. Um, but we own up to it. It was a trade that we took. And um, and so it's in our results. But it, I'll talk about that trade a little bit later as well, though, when we look at the bull put spreads and why we went to those. OK, so the other major algorithm that we trade is called the Momentum TY. So we just looked at the Momentum ES. That's the S&P algorithm that trades the S&P E-minis. Well, we also trade the 10 year. Now the 10 year, this momentum TY algorithm, it actually trades in all four systems. And this is actually the longest running algorithm that I have. This, uh, uh, not including the, the NASDAQ ones, but this is the longest running one that we trade today that we offer to new customers. What I wanna do is just highlight how this 10 year note algorithm did during the drop that we saw. So what this, is showing here on the bottom is the S&P E-mini, and you can see this big drop. Now the trades aren't here that we placed, but really it was just these trades that we that I highlighted here. Um, and you can kind of see that gap right in here where we took that initial really big loss. But what I wanna point out is notice how the 10-year actually rallied while the S&P sold off. So that's why we trade the 10-year as well as the S&P. The 10 year provides um, a bit of a hedge for us. Now it's not 100% um, hedged. In other words, they don't always correlate inverse to one another, but it does tend to trade inverse, especially during big market moves like we saw in February and March. So notice how S&P was selling off and you can imagine that we took the trades, the losses early on in February that, that hit us in those results that I showed you. But notice here in February, we actually had winning trades on the 10 year. But then look here in March, you actually see a lot of really good trades occur as the market was going lower. And what this shows right here is this is just from the SIM account on TradeStation of what, what the trades were that we placed. And you can see that we had a lot of really good trades all throughout February and March. And, and this even shows one of the losses we had in April. But but what I want you to see is, is these gains that we saw, the, the 843, the 1,781, that's per unit traded. So to give you an idea what, what that means on the accounts is if someone is trading the swing trader with a 20K account trading one contract, then on this trade right here, on trade number 393 in March, they made $2,000, which would have been on a 20K account about 10%. So, so the 10 year really does provide a bit of a buffer for us. Um, and I wanted to highlight this to show you uh, one reason why we did so good in March, even though the market was lower and, and just how this hedge works. Cause I know a lot of people are worried about the 10 year that will it keep going higher uh, if the market keeps going lower and you know, we'll keep following that trend until it doesn't. But as, as of now that this inverse correlation was still holding in Q1. Now Q2 has been a little bit different where in a lot of ways, the 10 year has drifted higher along with the market. But during these intense sell-offs, they certainly held that inverse correlation. So I wanted to show you that before we go on to the next slide, which we'll talk about the key events that occurred. Okay, so before we look at the key events that occurred uh, during 
um, the market uh, collapse in 2020. I do want to just highlight the performance reports that we have posted online, which talk about how well each algorithm has done since their inception. So here is the wave trader, the one that has done the best, but we can also look at the swing trader, which is this one here. This one is traded live now for uh, over three years. And so it has quite a bit of live data, but notice how it's up 32% now. And then of course, if we look at the, the pro and the crusher, you know, they're gonna not be up quite as much uh, where the, the pro is up about six and a half percent for the year. But I just I want to show this just to highlight that overall we've done really well uh, in 2020, uh, especially considering what the market has done. So with that in mind, though, uh, now that we've looked at the kind of the performance re uh, results for 2020, we've looked at how the momentum ES algorithm did, how the momentum TY algorithm did, and then just kind of highlighted again the overall performance that it's it's been, actually been really well. So now what I'd like to do though is look at the key events that have occurred during 2020. All right, so as I've already kind of mentioned, 2020 has been a very interesting year for us. It started out pretty well in January, but in February 2020, towards the end of February, the US equity market started pricing in the pandemic as, as it became clear that, that there would be a pandemic or that the, uh, the COVID-19 virus was, was spreading kind of throughout the world. And what this did is it created this new normal where instead of having relatively stable, low volatility kind of sessions, we were having large gaps in the overnight trades, um, multiple lock limit down openings where the S&P would open up uh, overnight at kind of the lock limit. And I hadn't seen that in the past uh, really ever, including in the back test. It happened in the NASDAQ once, but uh, not in the S&P. And this is really just a period of elevated volatility. Uh, and ultimately, it's it's because of this massive uncertainty regarding the implications of COVID. Will there be a virus or I'm sorry, a, um, a cure for the, the virus? And, uh, and and so as progress is made on that, on the vaccine, then that can impact the market. If there's new cases that's, that break out, it could impact the market. So there's just a lot of volatility. Uh, and this not to mention the economic impact of of having so many uh, economies shut down around the world. So that's kind of the new normal that we began seeing in February. And what that did is it prompted me to start looking at how uh, how we can be long the S&P, but not carry as much overnight risk. So it was clear to me that this volatility was going to stay uh, probably through the through the end of the year and potentially through the U.S. elections, um, potentially until 2020, when the virus does hopefully go away. Uh, but so this did force me to to go back and look at what can be done in order to minimize the kind of losses that we saw throughout here in February. In other words, right now or how the algorithm was trading in February, this, this kind of gap down created a big problem for us. I mean, because it went below our stop and it was a big hit, which is really, again, the main reason why we saw these kind of losses in February. Now, again, we rebounded well and the algorithms did really well, but it was clear to me that something needed to potentially change. Uh, we couldn't just keep being long the S&P. So throughout this R&D, there were really a couple things I looked at. Number one, I looked at, is there a way to minimize the number of overnight trades that we make or not be long going into a weekend, uh, try to get out a little bit earlier, those kind of things. And I looked at that, but ultimately what what I ended up kind of uh, going back to was if, if, we, if we used options instead of futures on the long S&P overnight algorithms, we could potentially avoid the risk that we were carrying by going long overnight. Uh, so that's really kind of what I did. I started looking at using put spreads. Um, in fact, bullish put spreads, meaning that we were short the at the money put and then we would buy and, uh, and out of the money put. And with these bull put spreads, we implemented that change and we've been trading live with those uh, really since early April or, or towards the end of March. 
And I'll just note that we, we kept the day trade algorithms running as is, and we kept the 10 year note running as is as well. So really all we did, the, cha the main change we made was to modify the overnight S&P algorithms to use the bull put spreads instead of just flat out buying the ES. And again, this was in response to this new normal of super high volatility where the risk that we're carrying overnight is just too much. So with that, let me go into what the bull put spread is and show you uh, kind of how those work and what their advantages are. Okay, so I know a lot of you are familiar with how put spreads work. But for many of you, uh, you're not, or this is new to you. So I just wanna start off by saying this. The reason why we are doing the bull put spreads is really so that when the market is going higher, um, like it was in January, but as the market was, was gonna be rebounding, as it goes higher, we can take advantage of a bullish S&P position by mitigating our risk. So, and, and I'll show you that when we get into the example, but. But if, if you're wondering why are we doing this, why not just keep buying the ES futures? The reason why is because the volatility was so high that we couldn't really carry the overnight risk of having a big move against us. So what we do instead is we could have A, just not traded the S&P and waited for volatility to drop, or B, do some kind of a put spread like we're doing uh, when we think we have a an edge to going long the S&P. So when you do a put spread, there's really two trades going on. First, we're selling an at the money put. And um, and so in this example, you see the little blue cross there, or X, that's where the S&P was at at the time this trade was, was placed. So you can imagine the S&P was rallying a little bit, and then we get a trade signal that says, we think the market's gonna go higher. So instead of buying the ES futures, we do this bull put spread. So what we do is we sell an at the money put, and in this case it was 27.45 and we collected 30 points of premium. Each point is $50 by the way. And if that's all we did, then we just would have been short a put uh, naked. And so what that means is, is we would have had no cover. So if the market would have dropped, we would have taken massive losses just like we could have when we're long the S&P. So that didn't really solve our problem. So what we do instead is we sell the put like we showed here, but then we also buy a put at 27.10, which costs about 16.5 points. And that's what this line on the bottom represents here is the uh, the long put that we buy. The reason why we do that is so if the market goes lower, our losses are capped. We don't lose more than what the difference is of the spread minus the premium we collect. And so that's what this text, these two paragraphs on the bottom are showing is, Number one, what our maximum gain would be. So we, when we do this trade, we expect the market to go higher and to, to close on expiration day higher than what our at the money put is. In other words, we think the market will go higher. And if it does, then we will collect 675 points, no matter what. So if the market rallies a thousand points, we still collect 675. Or if it basically trades one point above where we entered, if, if that's where it closes, then we still collect the entire 675 amount. Now what happens in the max loss case, um, and this is really where trading uh, put spreads like this gives us a pretty big advantage and helps us really navigate a more volatile market. Number one is, is this, if the market sells off below our long put, all the way down to 27.10. So again, the market was trading at about 27.45. Let's say it drops a percent, 30 points the next day. Instead of losing 30 points, the most we will lose is 35 points minus the premium we collected, which is about 21 points. And that happens to be our max loss. So if the market drops a thousand points, if it has a 20% crash, we still are only out $1,075. So that's the most we would lose. And that's really the beauty of these put spreads. If we have those big gap downs against us, the most we lose is 1,075. Now, of course, our gains are capped as well, and that's the trade-off, but it, it actually works out well, and it, and it has in the last four months as, as the data has, has shown us. But the other thing I'll mention is there's this other period of in-between. So you have the max gain and you have the max loss. There's also a, a place where uh, where your gain where you have a gain but it's just not quite as big, 
And that's if it trades kind of in this zone, which really is just the 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 premium we collect. So if the at the money put is 27.45, let's say it closes at 27.44. So one point below our short put. Um, in that case, we would collect not the full $675, but basically uh, 13 and a half points minus one point, about 12 and a half points. So every point below the at the money put, we, we lose $50 until it hits break even. And then we start losing $50 incrementally until it hits our worst case, um, which would be the, the long put location. Now, look, I, I know this is incredibly confusing, especially if you've never traded options before. So uh, don't worry. Don't worry if you don't really understand this. It's not super crucial. But what you can do is you could email me um, and I'd, I'd be happy to walk you through it in more detail. And we do have a document that we share that talks about it as well. But the key takeaway here is this, um, and I'll actually go on to the next slide so, so we can talk about the, um, the gains again a little bit more and the losses. So yeah, so before I talk about the advantages, let me just kind of finish with this slide. So what this is showing is the incremental uh, gain or loss based on what the S&P would close at. So again, ES settlement here is this. So the S&P was trading at 37.45 when we placed the spread. That's this point right here. And that's the 13 and a half points that we collected. Now, and this shows the, the value of the short option and the long option, and then the total profit or loss. And, and the key thing to look at here is notice the max loss is only the 21 and a half points. Even if the market goes down to 36.90, we're capped at negative 21, which is $1,000 and uh, $1,075. But our max gain is also capped at 675. And you might notice that, well, wait a second though, your your max gain is lower than your max uh, loss. Shouldn't shouldn't they be equal? Well, it really depends on the algorithm. In this case, because our win rate is so high, um, I believe it's in the 80% range. It's okay that we make less on those trades. Um, but the other thing you might notice is we're going long when the S&P is at 27.45. Notice how there's about a 10, about a 13 point window that we could be wrong and still be profitable. And that is really the other advantage of doing these put spreads is that we can actually be a little bit wrong and still have a winning trade. In other words, we can go long the S&P here Let's say the market the next day gaps up, then trades sideways, but then drifts lower and ends up closing kind of in the middle of this range here. Well, in that case, if it closes at 37.40, five points down from where we bought the, or where we placed the put spread trade, we still collect eight and a half points of premium and are up $425, even though we were technically wrong a little bit. That's really just the premium. So the, the premium gives you a little bit of a buffer as well. And so there's a few advantages to the put spreads, but that's just another one that I'll mention. So if you have questions on this slide or, or this one, feel free to pause it, look at it. You can Google uh, put spreads and you, you might be able to find, you probably will find someone that can explain them a little bit better than I probably did. Uh, and then of course you can email me and ask questions and, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you about what we're doing with those again. But really, uh, just to close out that thought, then we'll look at the advantages and disadvantages. I just want to highlight, really what we're doing is this. With the S&P, uh, because of the sell-off, the pandemic, this new normal was created. We had to do something slightly different because we simply can't be long the S&P when the, when the market was gapping down as much as it was. It's just, there's too much risk to carry on. Now, when volatility is low, the chances of that are so small that, that it's okay uh, for us to carry that risk. But in the midst of a pandemic, when the volatility is elevated, we, we knew we had to do something different until volatility goes lower. And fortunately, um, this bull put spread idea came into being and, and the back test showed that it should work really well. And at this point we have four months of live trades on them and then they really have done well as, as the accounts show. But I just want to close with this before I look at the advantages and disadvantages. Really all we're doing is we're placing a long S&P trade, but instead of going long the S&P, we're initiating a put spread. Okay, now what I'd like to do is talk about 
just kind of summarize the advantages of a bull put spread. So one big advantage is there's a predetermined amount of risk. And honestly, this is probably the biggest advantage. And, and if it wasn't for this, we might not move to these because they I'm not sure they would do uh, better than the S&P trades necessarily. It gives us a predetermined risk. So the biggest advantage, again, is the max loss we can take is is the 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 difference between the spread, which is 35 points, minus the premium we collect. And in that example, that would be that equates to a loss of about 21 and a half points. So that's the biggest loss we can we can take. Even if the market gaps down way below that, at least on the momentum ES algorithm, we our, our losses would be capped at, at the uh, at that price or at the uh, I'm sorry, at the 21 and a half points. Another reason, though, is it does put time decay in our favor. So many of you have probably bought puts before, uh, whether it's in the equity markets or maybe you've bought calls. And if you've been uh, an aggressive trader, one that, that maybe is willing to accept more risk, um, and, and this has probably been my experience as being willing to do that, you might have bought uh, out of the money puts or out of the money calls before. And, and you've, you've probably heard before that people say that, you know, the smart money is usually short those because they collect that time uh, decay. And in, in these examples, uh, time decay is definitely in our favor. So in other words, if uh, going back to this picture, if, the, if we initiate the trade at 27.45 and the next day the market closes at the exact same price, it's just flat, that's a win for us because the, the premium value more than likely will have gone down, at least the time component of it. Now, if volatility increased, then it might not be the case. But the other uh, point to, to think about is that we're, we're holding these for only one or two days. So we trade the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, options. So we, we do the one that's closest to expiration. So we're putting time decay in our favor. Um, another advantage is it does create a higher per trade win rate. That's At least that's what the data seems to show. Um, and the reason why is because when we're trading the futures normally, we we could get stopped out of trade. So like, let's say we bought at 27.45, just the futures. Then let's say the next day the market dropped 20 points and then rallied 100 points. Well, with our long ES trades, we have a stop of about 17 points. So we would get stopped out of that, take a loss, and then the market would rally. And, and, and we've had that happen before. But with these uh, bull put spreads, because we don't have to have a stop, again, because our, our max loss is defined, we don't have to run with a stop. So we don't really care what the market does in between us getting in the trade and the expiration. It could it could go up, down, up, down, up, down a, a million points and it wouldn't matter. What matters is where it closes uh, because, again, we don't get out of the trade early as well. And so what that does is it, it seems to create a higher win rate. And then the other reason why is, again, because of the... Um, because of the uh, the fact that we're doing selling an at the money put, so it creates a little bit of a window that's basically the amount of premium we collect where it could go down and we would still be uh, ahead. So we're we're putting a few different things in our favor. Those all translate to a higher per trade win rate. Uh, the final uh, advantage is that the margin requirement is lower as well. Now this is ultimately is up to the brokers. Uh, to decide that this isn't something I control. But generally speaking, it's better for the broker and for the clearing firm. Um, and I, I don't want to misspeak for them, so I'll be careful with my words here. But um, generally speaking, it's better for them if the risk is contained. So what I mean by that is if we go long the S&P, we need all the margin uh, to trade that, 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 the, uh, uh, that, the, that the brokers require. And the overnight margins uh, skyrocketed with the pandemic to, I, I don't know what they're at, but I was pretty sure they were above 8K for the S&P. Um, well, now with the bull put spreads, it gives a little bit more of a, of a comfort level for the broker and for the clearing firm because they know that the max loss, again, is, is, is fixed at that 21 and a half points. Now, if we're trading futures, you know, most of the time we have a stop in place. Like when the equity markets are open, we have a stop running. So the risk is also somewhat contained, although 
there's always the risk that it would blow through the stop that for whatever reason the stop wouldn't trigger and so there is some some risk uh, in just running with a stop on the futures that is just different with these options because of the contained um, the max contained loss that we can see so those are the advantages of the bull put spread. Now I don't have a slide on it, but there are a few disadvantages that I'll cover quickly. Uh, one is if the market rallies a lot, the most you make is $675 on this trade. So if the market rallies a thousand points, you're not collecting a thousand points. You're collecting only the premium you, you collected, the 13 and a half. So that's one disadvantage. Um, I would say another disadvantage is the commission is a little bit higher that the brokers charge and that's because of the it requires a little bit more work for them so they, they definitely work for that uh, but the commissions are a little bit higher as well now in our results we account for all that and all the modeling I've done we account for that I account for slippage so it's it's something that isn't a, a big difference because it's kind of built into the models but it is something that, that I thought I should mention um, other than that, though, I mean, the, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. Um, and what I, I think I'll do now is just briefly talk about how well these changes have done. OK, so in order to talk about how these changes have, have fared, or in other words, did we make the right call? Uh, you know, again, we could have simply turned off the S&P algorithm and run with only the 10 year and the day trades, or we could have left it alone and kept running with the, the S&P futures, the overnight futures, or the bull put spreads. Now, um, I think that this performance summary kind of sums up that, that we made the right decision. I, th I think it's safe to say at this point that we did. The reason why is you can see in February we took those losses, which by the way, if we were trading the bull put spreads way back here, you know, this loss, instead of being a 100 point loss, would have only been about a 21 point loss. So instead of about a 5K loss, it would have been about a thousand. So that's, again, the kind of thing we're, we're doing to try to uh, protect ourselves from that. But these results show that, that everything worked out pretty well. March was profitable for all four systems. Uh, May was in July. We've really only had two months that were down. That was June and April. And you can see that the up months were actually quite a bit bigger than the down months. So for sure, our results, if, if that's how we would judge whether or not we did the right thing, then for sure the results say we did. But the other thing that doesn't isn't really shown here, but it's sort of under the hood stuff is this. Um, we did the right thing because not only did we have gains like you see here, but let's say the market did collapse again and we had another kind of epic sell off with a whatever, a Dow gapping down 2,000 points, instead of taking a huge hit, we would have only taken about a $1,000 loss on that trade. So it's not only have we, we done well by being profitable, but we've also minimized our risk quite a bit. So, so that's, I think that's why I would say we did do the right thing and that the bull put spreads have worked out. And I'll talk about how long we'll, we'll hold, the, hold them for, but let me just show one more chart and then I'll get onto that. So this is really just the S&P. And, and again, um, you, you know, you're not going to be able to see in all the trades here, but these are all the trades that the futures would have taken. What I want you to focus on, though, is not that there were future trades being placed, but that the bull put spreads that we're trading are are triggered by the same uh, buy signal on the futures. So every time a futures trade was placed, we would we were placing a bull put spread instead. But I do want to just uh, kind of zoom in on a few of these just to kind of show you uh, what I mean. So number one, here's that gap down. This is again January. This is the gap down. This is kind of February in here. And as I scroll over, you'll see. The market dropped and notice again how the S&P algorithm got on the sideline. And this is really when I was doing all that R&D work to figure out how we should handle this. But then notice the S&P started rallying and it's right about in here that we started placing the actual put spreads. Um, so I guess it was kind of early April, um, which, by the way, the reason why we were up in March was because of the tenure. So uh, so even though we were flat, the S&P. We were in the 10-year, which was doing really well. But 
as the market was going out, so if we if we would have just sat on the sideline, then we wouldn't have been able to take advantage of this up moving market. But because we were in the bull put spreads, um, uh, you know, we were able to take advantage of this. So in the end, I think it was the right move for sure. And the only question we have now is. Um, how long do we trade the bull put spreads? In other words, at what point do we go back to just trading the futures the way that we did the previous three years by being long the S&P? All right, so again, here's a picture of the S&P. And what I'm trying to answer with this slide is the question, where do we go from here? In other words, when do we stop doing the bull put spreads and go back to the futures trades that we did uh, kind of back in January? And I think this chart is helpful because it, it highlights the volatility. So on the bottom, you see the VIX, basically. Now, what, what I want you to see is if you look back here in February and January, notice how the VIX was at a level that you can't even really see, just super low level. Like, I think it probably was in the 10 range between 10 and, and 15, somewhere in there. But then look what happened is the market started selling off. We had this massive spike in volatility. And um, in the spike in volatility lasted really all throughout the up move and what this means is that when the volatility is high like this we're able to collect uh quite a bit more on the premium so again if i go back here uh this was an actual trade that we placed um, i believe i don't have the date here but but it was an actual trade that we did and we actually collected 30 points for this short put and we only and we paid 16 and a half points for the long put. Well, as the volatility shrinks, we collect less on the short put, but then of course the long put is cheaper as well. But what it does is it, it makes this 13 and a half points that we see here to be lower. And so we like around now, I think we're collecting around 10 points of premium, which is still quite a bit. But eventually as, as the volatility goes back to the more kind of pre-pandemic levels, the premium that we collect will will keep dropping. And instead of being 10 points, it'll be nine. And instead of nine, it'll be eight and then seven and six and five and so on. And it probably won't get much lower than four or five points, but that's a pretty big difference between the 13 that we do now and four or five if the volatility is super low. Because what that does is it, it decreases the amount we make when we win and it increases the, the maximum loss. So, what that means practically is that there will come a point where the volatility will keep dropping and we will have to go back to the long S&P algorithm. Instead of doing this, put the put spreads, we'll be long the S&P like we did before. Now, the good news is when, when that happens, um, it's because the volatility will have dropped. And if the volatility is dropped, then that means the majority of the market players believe that there won't be as big a moves in the future. So I don't know if that's after the election or when there's a vaccine for the pan, for the COVID-19 or maybe it's before then if 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 you know everything else starts lining up. So we we really don't know, but what we do know is right now the volatility is still quite a bit uh incredibly high actually. It's at the time of this picture it was 27 um which if you look at all of 2018, 2017, the VIX, it's very rare that it ever would go above that. So it, this really is pretty high levels. Um, and the fact that it hasn't gone back to the 10, 15 range says that the majority of market players do believe that there's gonna be some very large moves ahead of us still. So what that means is we'll stay in the bull put spread. So as long as we collect a certain amount of premium, we will keep doing those trades. And you might wonder, well, what at what point does it make sense to not? And and I'm kind of reluctant to give a number here, but to give you an idea, if we were collecting six points of premium, I think that things would definitely start turning in the favor of just being long the S&P. There's a gray area, though, about seven or eight points where it's, it's a little bit harder to, to say. Certainly anything above nine points, it, then the right trade is absolutely the bull put spreads. But there, there is going to come a time where we will go back to the ES futures, and and we'll we'll tackle that bridge, you know, or we'll cross that bridge when it comes, um, and we might have more info on that uh, as we get closer to that. But for now, where do we go from here? 
we're just going to keep doing what we're doing now. We're going to keep trading the momentum TY. We're going to keep trading uh, the bull put spreads instead of the momentum ES and instead of the Geronimo. And then the for the pro trader and the S&P crusher, we'll keep doing the day trades as, as they are now. Uh, because again, those don't carry that overnight risk. And so it's okay for us to be long or short the S&P uh, because we have a stop in place during the day. But I think that kind of sums up the majority of what I wanted to talk about. So if, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Send us an email, sales at algorithmictrain.net. You can call us at this number here um, and, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate, if you're a customer of ours, we really appreciate you putting your confidence in us. Um, and if you're just kind of checking us out, then I hope what this shows is that we, our performance has been really well. We've actually done amazing throughout the pandemic. Um, not only that, but we've been able to adjust really well to the increase in volatility. So these, we don't just you know wait for bad things to happen. I mean, we're very proactive in what we're doing. And that paid off in the bull put spreads. And so, you know, I, I usually don't like to brag a lot, uh, mainly because if you've been trading the markets long enough, we've all been humbled. And, and there's a there's an element of, of for sure pride that we take in, in the algorithms because they've done so well. But it's we're also with the spirit of humility because we, we know that we've, we've been very fortunate to have the algorithms we have uh, to have been able to handle the, the pandemic in the way they did. And we're super glad that we've been able to deliver uh, pretty solid returns for our customers, especially the ones that are on the swing and the wave trader. And now, of course, we're climbing out of the hole and the pro and the, the crusher is up. So I think that's all I had. Uh, thanks again for watching and I hope you have a great day. Don't hesitate to email or call us if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye bye.